We are in the seal of Shisharim. We are in the Amino of Precious, which is the fourth level of purification, according to the Bricer of Rev. Pinchas ben Yair, and the commentary of our beloved teacher should rest in peace and have an Ilu in the Shema always in the highest heavens, the Ramchal, Reb Moshe Chaim Luzat. And as we've learned, and we've repeated again, that the first thing we had, we had Zahirus. We had watchfulness, Cheshbon and Nefesh, watching and seeing what we're doing, removing the negative traits that we carry on in our lives on a day-to-day basis in the big world of, of generals. Then we had Zahirus, we had alacrity of taking our physical quality of strength and the desire to pursue positive mitzvahs, running after positive mitzvahs. And then we came to Nikias, cleanliness, which is really a refinement in the area of Zahiras. It's not just taking a cheshbon of the bigger things, it's going to the prati and the details of the little things that we're doing in our life that are against the will of God, on the side of negative commandments. And then the Ramchal tells us something huge. We now in Precious enter into the world of Hasidus, where the first three, Zahiris, Zerizus, and Nikias, were qualities in Sidkias, which is righteousness. We're now entering the world of Hasidus, which is purity, which is Avodas Hashem Yom Velayla. It's over and beyond. It's Meshur Sadin. It's not just doing what you have to do or staying away from what you have to stay away from. Our goal now is to try to elevate ourselves to a new level of alacrity, but bigger than Zahiris, Zerizus, I mean. And he's going to explain some beautiful points right now that we have to understand that we shouldn't be sitting here with our heads bowed and broken about the impossibility of this. It was not made for everybody. In the general, it was made for people that have a desire to bring themselves to that place. And it was also made for the average man at the level that he can accept it. And that's what we have to get. This isn't an uptight person sitting around going, oh, I can't have it, I want it so much. That's not what we're talking about here as we're going to see. We had two things so far in Precious. Number one was we had Precious in food and drink. Number two, we had Precious in marital relationships. And today we're entering the third area of Precious, right? Of how indulgence in something that's permissible may lead someone to a vera regarding clothing and ornaments. The clothes that we wear, the way that we look, right? There's a quality in this. Listen, everybody has to get dressed. Everybody has to wear clothes. <laughs> it's what you're wearing, how you're wearing it. And there's a specific Indian and Precious we're about to undertake in looking at this area of how we dress. Lo has a hero's hatayra al yafam or al havanisam. We find that the Torah did not issue any warnings about the beauty or form. Ella, there's two when it comes to clothing. Shalo yiye behem kalayim. Except that you should not wear clothing that context contains a mixture of wool and linen. Shotness that we see in the book of Devorim. The ye behem sitzes. And secondly, if you're wearing a four cornered garment, what do you got to do? You got to put sitzes on the corner if you're a man. From Bamidba. The az kula mutarim then. Ikara din, conditions are met, they are all clothing is permitted with those two qualifications. I'm not me lo yada shimil vi shas ha pa'ir la harik ma tima sheikh haga'ava hugaiva. And who does not know that the wearing of finery and rich embroidery results in arrogance? We have to be careful. It doesn't seem like so much. But we have to be very, very cautious about the finery that we put on, the clothing that we put on, about not getting arrogant and cocky and walking around like roosters, right? The gam has nus, yigbal ba. Even immoral relationships are in its range of consequences about dressing to be provocative, as we all unfortunately see so much more in the streets. 
And there can even be, as we know, a person goes out in the streets, right? Totally sneers on all the rules met. Down to the wrist, below the elbow, below the knees, right? And yet provocative like no one's business. Totally mutter. But you've got to be careful. Milvad, when I say totally mutter, I mean within the realms of the laws of, of, of Heter. Not in the spirit of the law, but certainly in the letter of the law. Milvad hakina the hata'iva the ha'oshek. Oshek. Aside from the jealousy, desire, and cheating. Oy. Again, we wear these clothes. I love it around in Eretz Israel so much, in the general part of it. I see that my daughters and my wife and the family go out to shop, and they buy stuff that's three years old. Couldn't care less. <laughs> you know? It's reduced in price. In America, you wouldn't touch it, right? It's not this year's style. But here, they send the stuff over here, and they don't care what the stuff is. It's not such a thing. Oh, how can you wear that, right? It's out <laughs> It's not this year's model. Who cares? It's on sale. It's sneers, right? It's a different world. There are other people that in America. I'm not blaming America. I'm not picking on it. But they wouldn't wear it because it's not from this year. That's what he's talking about. Oh, well, how can I go out in the street? I don't have the latest style. Oh, even this, I like the men especially. This thing's been hanging around for what someone once said, Rabbi Green, I think, mentioned once, right? This isn't like 16th century Polish right, uh, aristocracy. This is like 1950 businessmen you know, in America. A black suit, a white shirt, right? That's it. It's easy in the closet when you get up in the morning. You don't have to make your choice of what color suit you want to wear, right? But sneers. And therefore, it's uvenim shachim mekol rashahu yakar al adam lahasigu. That that can result from the pursuit of anything that is costly for a person to obtain. Again, there's a matter of finances. You have clothes. You don't have to get shark skin suit or whatever it would be. Not that you shouldn't wear nice. You wear nice, clean, and covered clothes. But you see some of the prices that people or what they go out for when it comes to shoes and things, right? Things like this. It's also a waste of, of the finances that were given to us. Ukivar amru zachronim lebracha. Indeed, the sages of blessed memory said, "Right, kevan shiroe hayetsa adam the tole the akas ba'akevo." When the evil inclination sees a person strutting around haughtily, whoa! Yeah, you see it. You can see it when a person walks. See the great Gedolim, they walk in a, in a way of humility. It's a way of carrying oneself. It's not strutting around with this great pride. It's also not being a schlepper. It's not being a, a dishrag, a, a doormat. Right? The evil inclination sees a person strutting about mimashmesh, begadav and bisawsal, bisaro, smoothing his clothes and grooming his hair. Oh man, this is their Shelly, that's my meat. Finished. This fella is mine. Due to the many sins that result from adorning oneself successively, one who does so is easy prey for the Yet Sahara. That was the third one. So again, clothing, again, precious, is modesty. It's not being dressed in rags, it doesn't look like it's not a Kiddush Hashem. And it's the same point, right? It's not necessarily getting oneself all dotted out with the finest of the finest and the latest models and everything. There's a mean, a balanced place, the Rambam's middle road, so to speak. Clean, sneeze, and making sure there's no suggestiveness of anything of haughtiness in it. Just dressing. Not standing and prompt primping in front of the mirror, right, to get yourself ready. The fourth and final example of permissible involvement in worldly matters leading to sin is a very interesting one that I wouldn't have thought of, and he says is what? Regarding strolling for pleasure and any similar leisure activity or casual talk. What do you do with your time? What do you do with your time when you're not learning? Yes, you have to know your balance. There's a time to learn there's a time you have to take a breather. Not everybody can sit like the Vilma of Gon. Vilma Gon sat, they said, 22 hours a day with his feet in water and three years old knew all of the Chomish and six years old was giving Shirim and the Ian. It's unique and unique and unusual. And that was the level he was at. But here we're talking about bittal time. 
Im eno bedibur iser, if it does not involve forbidden subject. These things are permitted to talk about. You can hang out. There's no law against hanging out per se at the level that you're at. Vadai din teira mutahu, it's certainly permitted by Torah law. Amnon, kama bitul Torah nimshach mimenu, but how much neglect of Torah study ultimately results from taking that stroll or by that small chatter? We do not understand as a generation for the most part the chashivas and the importance and the relevance of every letter and every word of Torah that was to say. It's no small madrega to get to the level of feeling that, to feel a certain place that it's just, I'm, I'm not taking proper use and making proper use of a precious gift I was given, which was time. Kama min ha hara, how many fashion, how much lush and hara, denigrating speech, hui, ha-shalom. That's, that's on the negative side. This was the other thing, was just taking time to just never pet, just speaking, just wasting your time with it. Not to mention the other things that slip out of one's mouth when one's talking just in general. Kamen min ha-shekadim, karim, excuse me, shekerim, how many lies are told, the kamen min ha how much mockery comes out of a person's mouth when they're involved with, with casual talk, the Omer, Kerov, Devorim, Lo, Yakdal, Pesha, states in reflection of these truths in an abundance of words, offense will not be lacking. Again, it's a level of everybody to understand from themselves. You're just naturally pulled in. Just you want to say something. Quiet is uncomfortable a lot of the times. The above illustrations demonstrate the clear necessity for precious. These are areas, again, stepping according to where you feel comfortable. Not completely comfortable, but you're not punishing yourself. Step in where you are right now and take a step in all of these areas, he's saying. Klau hadava, the sum of the matter is what? Kavon shakol in yanin ha'olam eno ela sekanos atzmos. All worldly matters are nothing other than extreme dangers to our spirituality. God created the world for that. It's a trap. This whole place is a trap. And it's the rare individual, hoping everybody listening to this is a rare individual, rare individuals, there's not many in the world. We want to be included upon them. That are looking to grow ourselves closer to God, to do more of the work of God and to discipline ourselves, to not just take whatever comes our way and say, well, it came my way, it must be, it's what I want to do. The whole system was set up for us to use our Bechira Chavshit, our free choice, to elevate ourselves, to fix ourselves, to improve ourselves, to make ourselves more of the Tzel and Melokim that we were created to be. I personally get conflicted because when I walk around the old city, I see a tremendous amount of modesty. But when I walk around in places where I come from in New York, within the religious community, I see $5,000 wigs, very expensive clothing. Well, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about, right? He's saying that was it. So here, thank God, again, the, 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 the economical structure here does not allow, for most part, what it is, left, is over there, right? People here, there's definitely a modesty in Eretz Yisrael in terms of, of financial expenditures. People just don't have it here. And they live with it. In America, a lot of people have it and they flaunt it. And you're right. That's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking to those people. He's also talking to everybody at their own level. That's one of the things that I'm getting out of this is some reading. We're not all on the level. We're going to see it today. He's going to talk about it. If we get that far in the next couple of pages, he's going to talk about that. And everybody has to understand where you're holding not everybody is at the place of being in Kedusha. Not everybody is in the place of even being in precious. To try to do certain things, maybe. And what you're saying is absolutely true. Here are people, right, that are absolutely letter of the law. There's not a thing on that's not sneers, But you, you can't avert your eyes on the streets. Or gaudiness or a certain arrogance that people are walking around with. It's much more prevalent. There is here also. It happens to be not so much, thank God. But whether that's a matter of finances or whether people working on themselves, that's another question that has to be answered. 
because when I was in Renana or when the Herzliya, it was, you know, it was just similar to what I see in New York. And Drew, this, the old city is completely different. I'm sure Bene Brock is completely different, but. Uh, yeah, very different. Bene Brock is the world by itself. Right. And, you, you, and again, with political correctness, is the biggest plague that's hit this generation. This political correctness stuff. There's no more right and wrong. It's only political correctness. And you can't say that politically. Well, it's a sin. It's an affair. God said so. I don't care. It's not politically correct. This political correctness is destroying the world. No one's willing to stand up for anything true anymore. Right. That's, that's all right. How can you say to somebody you're being seductive, seducer, seduce? What's the word? Seductive. Seductive. Can't say that to somebody. Right. Why, why, did, why did you look at somebody was seducing me, really? They, they were asking for it. What are they asking for? It? It's, they can do what they want. It's, it's a, a vicious cycle. Since all worldly matters are nothing but other extreme dangers to one's spirituality, that's the whole point of this whole book. Listen, by the way, if you're not interested in this, don't come to this class and don't listen to this book. Because this book was only written for people who are interested in making themselves into bigger and better human beings and becoming more spiritual. This wasn't written for the, anybody to go and read. This wasn't a nice bedtime book for people reading to read a nice novel before they go to sleep at night. This book was written as a manual for people that have a desire to improve themselves, to make themselves better than they are, to get to a higher level of accomplishment, to, to fulfill what they were put in this world here to be. That's all of us, whether we admit it or not. It doesn't matter. The sages tell us we all came here with a tafshi, with a purpose. And the people who found that person, it was not to lower and denigrate ourselves down to being lower, it was to raise ourselves up, to become more humane, more kind, more beneficial, more I, looking around to see who we can help. It's the, it's the, the war that's going on, the shummer against the goof. Clearly a battle. And therefore he says, Eich lo yeshabach mi shiyitza le'malet mehem or shiyerbe how can there be anything but praise for one who wishes to escape them and one who goes the great lame to distance himself from all these different affairs? Now, the world doesn't look at it as a thing of such great value anymore. The world is just going down and down and down. And there are people working hard to elevate themselves. There's a whole society of people all over the world. Not, it's not geographical just that are trying to work on themselves, that really see and take the word of God to be true, that our job here is to elevate ourselves, to become the Selim Elohim we were created to be. To be, we were created in the image of God, right? And we're meant to emulate the ways and the needles of God. As best we can for what we see of being giving human beings, caring human beings, compassionate human beings, feeling human beings, sensitive human beings, on and on and all the needles that we've talked about. Zehu inyan haprishus hatov. This then is the definition of a good form of precious. Doing the things is taking things that even though they're permitted, we're going to see, and we said it already in the area of relationships between husband and wife. Where you are is where you have to take on the assignment. This is not about self denial. In a certain way it is, but the real thing is that there's a greater reward for taking on, there's a greater feeling of significance by taking on these, separating ourselves from certain things that are permitted, because it's a higher goal that's being achieved. And when a person sees that, it's a different ballgame altogether. It's not about self-denial, that's what Precious says, separate yourself from it. But it's more about a higher goal. It's more about being able to say as much as I want that I'm going to say no. We can see it in our life, wherever it is. You have some kind of food in front of you, right? You don't need it. You don't need to eat it, right? And you're not like, oh, I'm so uptight, he's not eating that. No, it's not what it is. I choose now to not eat this thing. I choose now to not go after my tithers, after my physical desire, because my neshama, as Ben Yaman said, wants to express itself more to understand that consciousness if you're dealing with it. That one should not take anything from this world 
with any use that he makes with it. Again, that one should not take anything from the world with any use that he makes it. Ella mashahu mirach bo mitne hatzorech asher lo beti vo elog. Except that is essential to him because it's what his nature requires. This is a very, very big point in the precious. Note that a basic part of the definition is that one not deprive himself of that which is essential for his nature. Where you're hoping, you have to take care of things. So is this precious? Or it's precious. Is this, is this like a bit like beyond what's expected? Or is this yes, like absolutely true? beyond what's expected. Precious already is in the, in, in, in the uh, Yaakov uh, Hillel. has five books that I want to get from America or on Amazon on, on this. The f- he starts off in Precious. The first five bo- the first part of the books are in Zahiris, Zerizus, and the Kias. Those are in Yonav, in Sidkias, being a Tzaddik. That's making sure you do what has to be done and not being over any prohibitions. Precious already starts a whole new world. Precious is a world of positive actions, of starting off by not allowing yourself to take things that you're allowed to have, they're kosher but re- re- moving, removing yourself from them and desires from them for a higher purpose, which is uh, Kiddush Hashem all the time, Yom Velayim. And this is Precious, he says clearly, he says Precious is going to say it to us in a couple of pages, Precious is not for everybody. In a level, yeah, to do things small is what you can do. The person has to have here a belief in God and a belief in the revelation of the rabbis through the Torah, and a belief in a higher possibility for man to become more angelic, so to speak, in the word of accepting as Ben Yoman used it. His neshama is coming more to the forefront and his goof is going more to the background. It's not becoming less human, it's becoming more human in the words of his feelingness and his sensitivity to everything around, but it's less with the body and more with the soul. As the Ramchal explained below, depriving oneself that way is included in the bad precious which is self-denial because you're going to push yourself to doing that when you're not in that, when you're not in that league. Of which the sages disapprove, the Ramchal mentioned his nature because Parishas must be elevated according to the physical and emotional needs of each individual to understand where you are. As the Ramchal noted at the end of chapter 1, the pleasures of the world are worthwhile insofar as they give a person contentment and peace of mind to focus on the greater task he's created to fulfill. If you are now denying yourself food and denying yourself a meal that's permitted to you, and at the same time for the next three hours you're thinking about the food and you can't pay attention to your learning, you miss the point of preachers. That's not it. Right? That's not what preachers is about. It's not the goal, you, you, it's costing you. You didn't make it, you missed the point. Precious has to be something that, that is attaining its goal. That's not attaining a goal. And the Ram call right here is called, the footnotes calling it, right? Improper precious. All right? The statement to the sages cited above in support of the precious referred to the, this kind of abstinence. Who? Okay. Who ma shehishtabeach, Rebbe, the Amar shezicharti? This is what Rebbe, Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, praised himself for this in the statement. I mentioned above, when he declared, now Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi was not an uptight guy, <laughs> to use our everyday kind of language, right? Shalo nehne min ha'olam hazeh afilu ba'atzba kitana. That he did not take pleasure from the world even in proportion to the toil of a little finger. This is remarkable inasmuch as he practiced this abstinence despite the fact he was Nasi, leader of Israel. And his table was of necessity laden with all the delights of the royal table in keeping with the honor of his priestly position. It wasn't right. Couldn't have people come in and not eat. This is one of the major points of this. One of the things you're knowing if you're doing right here and you're on the right path, he's he's really going to emphasize right now, I'm going to state it general and we'll read it. 
when guests come to your house, you make sure you do everything to take care of everything that they need. Don't be a precious, a person that's separating from stuff, right, that you don't have it, so therefore nobody can have it, because I can't have it in my house. Don't be from on someone else's cash. Don't be from on someone else's cash. That's what we don't want to do. You want to do it, you're right. You got precious, do precious. I should have great pleasure, though, right, feeding it to everybody else and giving the things that I choose not to have because I'm doing it out of an act of love, of self-dedication for wanting to improve myself. That was Rebbe Yehud Nasi. His table was filled with everything that was available in the world when it was available. So when you came to, he made sure, and that's as it was just said so beautifully, don't be from on somebody else's cheshbon. And the prophecy conveyed by R- Rivka when she carried Yaakov and Esau in her womb. Shnei goyim bevitneich. Two nations, goyim, are in your womb. The sages expound, do not read goyim nations, but rather read geim, proud ones. Zer Rebbe Antigonus. The reading of the verse alludes to Rebbe, son of Yaakov, Rebbe Yudanasi, and his contemporary, the Roman Emperor Antinios, Antinonis, I guess, Antonius, who was from Asaph, Shalo Posach, Ma'al Shulchanam, the low Hazeris, the low Kashus, the low Sinon, who, the two of them, were proud in the sense that neither lettuce, nor cucumbers, nor radishes ceased to be found on their tables. Velo bimos hachama, velo bimos hageshamim, whether in the summer or in the winter. In Talmudic times, these vegetables were generally not available. When they were not in season, only the very wealthy could afford to import them during the winter from distant places in the more temperate climate. It's not like now with refrigeration and jet planes. And, you know, they bring it to you wherever you want. You got, you know, fruits around all year long. It wasn't that way back then, but they had it all. But the footnote says here, very big. Let me get there yet, just a minute. And that's, even though Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi set his table lavishly year-round, he was careful to eat only what he needed. Now listen to this. To do what? To maintain his health. This is a Torah. This is Masil Shasharim. We're not talking about some hippie book from the Rainbow family, God bless him. Conscious about diet. Here's Rev Yehuda Hanasi. He ate what he needed to maintain his health and his sustenance and his level of hashivas and, 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 and the strength that he needed to learn at the maximum extent of his ability. He was careful to eat only what he needed to maintain his health with no thought for superfluous pleasure. The footnote here is extremely beautiful. Rev. Akiva Ellinger, in Mior HaMesila, sees an underlying lesson in the fact that Rebbe's table was always set in a grand manner. He always went in there, it was filled, even though he refrained from any delicacies himself. Now, you can say, oh, that guy's really uptight. He was not uptight. He was happy to do his aknesis orachim. He was happy to see that everybody should have what they wanted. He didn't feel deprived. He felt that his physical health and his strength and an ability to learn Torah and do what he was doing was more important than his own desire for physical food. As the Nasi Rebbe needed to set a ta- royal table not merely to honor his position, but because he was always visited by many guests, it is important for one who is embarking on a program. Here we go. Appreciates to remember that although he views unnecessary pleasures as detrimental, this should be only in regard to himself. When it comes to others, he must retain a generous mindset and seek to meet their every need not to judge. You may talk to people, students may come, friends may come and ask for opinions, but generally you want to just, I can only think of my Rav Rev of Rommel Brog. When I come to his house, and I used to come to, up to the yeshiva in Peekskill years ago, everything in the pantry, everything in the freezer, everything in the refrigerator was put out on the table. There was nothing, that everything was empty, the pantry was empty when he got it out. Anything except the things that were doubles. Everything was out there to make sure I felt good. He didn't eat with me. He made sure when I came in I had what I might need. Rebbe made sure that this on his table was sets of all kinds of delights as befitting a Nazi so that his household and guests would enjoy it the very best. 
At the same time, however, he himself did not indulge in any of the lights. This is a kind of precious. It's a matter of choice. You're right. But I don't think it was a matter of choice. And sometimes, yes, it's hard. You have to say no. No is a very important word in this business. It takes us, no, I don't need that right now. I'm not going to starve myself to death, but right now, no, I don't need it. Discipline. That's right. This is talking about discipline. That's a dirty word in this world, right? Discipline? There's no discipline. Nobody has discipline anymore. It's not a higher... Discipline used to have value on it. There's no high value in discipline in this world. There's no discipline in the wasted world? There is. Very little. If it feels good, do it. If it tastes good, eat it. Right? What's yeah. a discipline? I mean, there's a level of discipline. There's a discipline in kashrut. I'm not going to eat that because it's not kosher. Right? There's a different discipline to say, I'm not going to eat that even though it's kosher. There's a pushback in discipline? In oh, I think. Well, just think about 65, they say 65% of people in the United States, I don't know about the world, are obese. So that's lack of discipline. Excuse me? No? The, 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 the food. It's because oh, yeah, I, I it's because that. of the foods they're eating. Right. From the grocery stores that has salt, sugar, and oil. They are addicted to it. Right. And it's not giving them nutrients. Right. That's by a biochemist to work for one of the cereal companies who went to the CEO. They told him he was starving out of everybody and they fired him. I agree with what you're saying. They don't know. They're so addicted to the salt, sugar, and oils in the food. They don't even know that being starved. They feel like they're full, and two hours later, they have to get another bottle of cereal or whatever it might be. A tough one to break. Yeah, no, it's uh, very, very difficult. Very, very so addicted to, the, to those foods that they think that they're... Tastes good. Salt, sugar, and what's the other thing? Salt, there? sugar, and oil. Wow. Well. The oil is even worse because corn syrup and any of that is a little disguised as sugar. Mm-hmm. Olive oil is good, right? According to Dr. Eccleston, who was a cardiologist in New York, the answer is no. So, no oil is good. I uh, have a little oil, but not like people pile on oils. Oh, yeah, I know. I, I get it. What did it say? What did it say? Hmm? What did it say? No, that's where you have, if you take nuts, right? The, nut, the nuts, the, the nuts with salads, nuts have oil to them. So those oils are very important to deliver the nutrients that are in the that are in the greens and the blues and the yellows and the reds to get into your that the villi in your system absorb them. So I have it with nuts. Plus, yeah, you get a little amino acids as well. Really, you feel so and the way you lose about two pounds a week without starving. It's not a diet. It's not a um, diet, that's for And sure. then you'll get to a point where you keep on eating, you don't gain weight, and you don't lose weight. And you're totally, you're always satisfied. You, know, you never overeat. I've been experiencing that for the first time in my life in many years. It's just not a desire to eat. I finish, put it away, and that's it. I'm with my meal. Yeah. Right. I lost 40 pounds, but that was only a sign. I did not go on a diet. I just stopped. I'm not saying complete, but I got rid of sodas, and I got rid of cakes, and I got rid of all the extra bread. And every time I wanted to have something to eat, I had carbohydrates and spaghetti and all. I just started eating vegetables and fruits and salads and having some good bread with my evening meal. And during the day when I get hungry, having nuts and seeds and dried fruits, or fresh fruits, whatever it is. As my book would say, you got rid of the chazarai. And it's been remarkable. I feel great. Yeah. You know, I can hope to continue. But the thing that's bigger to me than even all of that is the fact that it's become a way of life. I no longer think about those things, which is huge. Yeah, because it's almost well, not completely, but for pretty much. Cakes, I mean, I have to say no. That cake behind me, that ruggler, I love rugglers. Right? Who doesn't love rugglers? 
Well, I love Ruggles, but I have to say no. But I don't feel like I'm depriving but myself. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make a difference if once you're on, once you're on the program, so you come along and ruggle up? Nah, I, that I don't. That like doesn't it. bother me. But I have. I could eat one every time I walked by there if I didn't have the word no in my vocabulary. Right. You got, no's not a bad word. It's okay. You can, that's discipline that we're talking about. The Western world don't want to know from discipline. The Eastern world, I don't think anybody wants to know from discipline. It's self-denial. Rev. Yisrael Salanta would say that when dealing with oneself, one should always choose. We could have a l'chaim on this one. <laughs> G- Gaddy, Gaddy said, took the words right out of his mouth. Right? You can always choose the needs of our soul over those of his body, but when dealing with others, one may not overlook their physical needs. You may be working with somebody and helping them and how to do things better, but you can't impose a will on them. Your job is to make sure that you are... What was that sentence? To the contrary, tending to the physical needs of others is a spiritual occupation. You see, people get what they need at that time, right, to take care of them. That's why you can't have that, it's no good for you. <laughs> You can do that to yourself, because I don't choose to have that. Well, no, it's, it, that's what it's talking about. It's just in our modern technological wor- world that we have this big problem that people are so addicted to. Mm-hmm. to and, but it, in, their, in his time, the foods were nutritious. They didn't so have all the processed foods that we exactly, had Exactly. They had, they had uh, fruits and vegetables. What did you eat? I lived out in the wilderness. You didn't have refrigeration like you have now. Right, you had whatever the food. You went to the market. You had a you had a mono diet. You had a carrot. You know that was a meal already. Right? You had you know tomato, whatever it was. You ate. That was your food. Now we have forty-seven different condiments to put on the forty-seven different condiments. Right? We, and the, the additives and the processed foods. And it's quick, right? So continuing on. He goes on to say, "The Zichron Melech Yehuda Kemo Kain ve'Has Ki Yahu." He said, "Hiskiyahu, the Melech Yehuda Kemo Kain." The sages' statement regarding Hiskiyahu, king of Yehuda, likewise said, "What v'Sha'ah Ma'arim Shizacharti." The other statements of our sages that I mentioned, "Kula Mikayim v'Morim Shiyesh La'Adam Lufros Mekoma." Shahu ta'anug olami, all support and demonstrate the concept that a person should abstain from anything that is simply from the world of pleasure. Ulama'an lo yipol bisakanaso, so as not to fall into the dangers that they possess, that it poses. Now, this again is a level you have to be on. It's not so simple to do. Right? You, 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 you're just not going to cut yourself off from worldly pleasures unless the payoff comes out to be much bigger and you realize what that payoff is. Until such time, you know, you can't self-flagellate, you can't beat yourself up, but there is this desire to go away from these things for a higher purpose. The Ram is thus to find the good from precious, the good form of precious, and has answered the question he raised above about where to draw the line. It is praiseworthy to refrain from worldly pleasures that are not necessary for one's well-being according to his nature. According to his nature. The Ram now addresses the other argument against precious that he mentioned above. The im tish'al v'toma, and if he will ask, saying, im came, eifo, if it is true that then that precious is something necessary and essential lama lo gazra alav why didn't the sages make a decree regarding it right if it's so necessary why not that's because not everybody uh, can afford it yeah that would just got us another drink kemosha gazru of course, that's only the finest wine. Al hasigud sigios vehatikanos shigazru, just as they, <laughs> just as they just as they issued decrees for all the safeguards and punishments that they they decreed. That is, since the case for precious is presented above as compelling, why did the sages not institutionalize the practice by setting formal limits of physical desires like eating, cohabitation, elegant dressing, and idle conversations? 
make rules about him? And the answer is, David said already, he need the shuva is mivo eris peshuta. The answer is clear and simple. Kol lo gazru achamim gezera. The rabbis never made a decree. Eleim kain rov hatzibor yecholim leamud ba unless the majority of the public was able to comply with that decree. The ein rov hatzibor yochlim lehios chasidim. And the fact that most members of the public are not able to practice Hasidus. That's a huge statement. Mm-hmm. Rather, it's sufficient for them that they should be classified as Siddiquim. At the beginning of this chapter, the Ram called divided the trade of Reb Pinchas into two distinct sections. Those that will bring a person to Tzidkiyas, a righteous person and those beginning with precious that elevate a person beyond that to become a chassid. Here the Ramchal notes that since attaining full chassidus is not within the reach of the majority of the population, precious, which consists of practices that are within the realm of chassidus, were not mandated by the sages with formal decrees. They couldn't do it wasn't meant to be done and they couldn't do it. The sensitivity, of course, of the sages was always there. And he brings a very, very important key footnote. Commentaries to Masila Shasharim point out that the Ramchal does not mean that most people are completely exempt from focusing on the traits that lead to Hasidus. It doesn't make, oh, I'm only going to be, I only have to be, no. It's not enough that you just beat Siddhi, just go to Siddhiyas. The principles of precious are still there for you. The fact that you're not maybe going to come to be to the level of Hasidus, rather, since Hasidus is a very lofty level, most people will not achieve a complete attainment of Hasidus following the step-by-step process of the levels of precious, Tahara, etc. However, all people at any stage are still obligated to work on aspects of Hasidus that are appropriate to them when something speaks to you. You know what it is. That's too much for me. I couldn't hear that. So I'm not going to self-flagellate myself. Well, that I hear. It's going to be hard, but I think that would be beneficial to me. That is not an excuse. Well, I don't have to do that because I'm not going to be a chassid. Even at the beginning of one's journey, there are facets of chassidus that one must be aware of and strive for, though he may not be able to execute them in a complete manner to make an attempt. Again, we hear people that are reading the Sefer and people sitting in these circumstances are all agreeing that I want to make myself into a better example of a human being and a better example for all humanity or else you're not involved in this. You're not here. You don't show up. You go out and play golf, go fishing, do something. You're not going to be doing this. I'm sorry. Oh, celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> For example, if a person cannot achieve precious in all things, one may set for himself specific boundaries in certain areas of his life. Likewise, even if a person cannot achieve precious at all times, one may set a time for him certain times to practice precious. Indeed, many practice aspects of precious during the month of Elul. There's a one, there's a simple example. During Elul, we, we shoot for a higher goal. These were things I tried all year and I wasn't successful. Maybe just the fact I do it for 30 days or 40 days or 50 days, that's a, 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 a reasonable goal that I can make. That's a level of precious. And it's expected that this be done during the 10 days of repentance from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So those are real goals for set periods of time. Or again, the miser itself is a goal. Thus, the sages did not institute boundaries of precious as part of the code of law because only a minority are able to attain chasidus on a systematic level that's going step by step and working on themselves and desiring to work himself on that label, level. It seems from here he's plying there's no crime and no sin in a person coming to a level of tzidkius, at the level where he ever is at, not going for precious. But all people are called to the highest level of service of Shem and should aspire to those levels wherever they're capable of attaining. So it was 30. And then he says, Ach has redim asher behem. But for the select minority of the elation, the hafetzim v'zuchus l'gvaso yizborah who wish to merit the closeness of Hashem, blessed be he, Zuchus 
And though, and through their own merit to confer similar merit to all the rest of the populace that is dependent on them, so that all will achieve a degree of such closeness to him. And he's going to explain this. Lehem, Magia, Lekayim, Mishnas, Hasidim. It is their change, it is their charge, excuse me, to fulfill the code of the Hasidim, the obligation that pertain only to exceptionally pious people, as we will surely see. Asher lo yuchlu lekayim ha'acherim, which the others are not capable to fill. Haim, haim, sidre, ha'perishus, ha'ela, the details of this code are these very guidelines of precious that we've been discussing. The division of obligations, one level of obligation for those who can be tzaddikim, and a higher level of, <coughs> of those who seek to be chassidim serves a distinct purpose. Ki bezeh becha Hashem. This arrangement is what Hashem chose according to the realities of the human society that he created. For since it is not possible for the entire nation to be uniform with everyone at the same height of the understanding and virtue, because there are invariably differing levels of spiritual attainment among the people, each person according to his own intellect. Still, at least a few precious individuals will always be found, thank God, among the people. Who will prepare themselves fully and attain the heights of Hasidus. And through the merit of those who are also prepared, the Gam ha beauty, Muhanim, the Al Avaso, his Barak, the Hashraas, the Shekhinaso, those who are unprepared for this lofty level will also merit the love of Hashem. Blessed is he, and the result of his Shekhinah's presence will be upon them, those who have attained the highest level of Hasidus and who merely merit the Shekhinah, who thereby merit the Shekhinah, rest upon them bring a measure of the exalted level to all Jewish people through the fundamental connection that all Jewish people have to each other. Call our raving Zeal Zeh. For the future discussions and explanation of this matter, we're going to see that anyone who pulls himself up, we're all being pulled up with that person. It's similar to that the sages of blessed memory expounded regarding the four species in the mitzvah of lulav, i.e. the lulav and other three A species taken together. What yavo ela kapru al ela. That let these righteous Jews, represented by the species possessing fragrance and good taste, which is the esro, come and atone for those represented by the species deficient in those qualities. What's that? The Midrash compares each of the four species to a different group of Jews. The Esra, which is both taste and fragrance, corresponds to people with merits of both. Torah study and mitzvahs. The Lula, which has a taste, right, and the, and the dates of the palm, but no fragrance, represents people who study Torah but do not observe mitzvahs properly. The Chadassim, fragrant but taste, corresponds to those who do observe the mitzvahs but are lacking in Torah study. And the Aravos, with no redeeming qualities, represent those people who lack Torah study and mitzvahs. On Sukkot, we join all four species together, signifying the more worthy members of the nation can atone for those of the less deserving. They're all in the same bundle. And we'll finish off with this. The Ramcha shows the source of the special code of Hasidim that he mentioned above. Who Indeed, we find that the concept in something that Eliyahu and Navi, who was remembered for good, the expression of blessing is often invented to mean Eliyahu, 
that what he said to Yeshua ben Levi, Bima de Ula Ba Kosh Kosh In the instance of Alula Ba Koshev from Trumos. 8036, the incident was as follows. A Jew named Ulubar Koshe had been sentenced to death by the Roman authorities. He fled and sought refuge in Lud, the home of Yeshua ben Levi. The Romans, who having discovered the fugitive's whereabouts, surround the city and deliver an ultimatum. Either surrender the condemned man or you will rouse, will rouse the city. But Yeshua ben Levi, seeing no way out of the predicament, persuaded Ulubar Koshe to give himself up and then handed him over to the Romans in doing so. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi had acted in accordance with the ruling which states that when murderers specify a member of the community which they seek and they threaten to kill the entire group on his account and is permitted to hand them over to them rather than have the entire group killed. Now, Kisheheshivu Shivo Velo Mishnehi when Reliahu rebuked Rev Yeshua ben Levi for the way he handled the incident, and Rev Yeshua ben Levi replied, Is this action that I took not prescribed by the Mishnah? Afu Omer Lo, Rev Eliyahu answered him in this kind, The key Mishnah Hasidim he. But is that a Mishnah of Hasidim? Does your behavior conform to the Mishnah, the code that requires of Hasidim? Surely not. One who is on the level of a chassid is required to abide by a higher standard of conduct than that which applies to others. The footnote says, to close off, the ruling that you just cited pertains to righteous Jews, but there's a higher standard for those on your level of piety. Right? As it says in the Schottenstein, Yerushalmi Trumos 84b for further discussion. The Ramkal cites this incident to demonstrate that similarly, precious, which is part of the pathway to chassidus, can be a standard only for greater people and cannot be mandated by the sages for all people. And that's what we're holding when we finish today, is to realize where we're holding on the scale. But we're here, we're driving, we're striving, we want to do things in a better way, we want to cleanse ourselves. We want to follow the dictates, not of our feelings in the world around us as much as we do to follow the dictates as the pale and the path and the trail that the Basila Shasharim is giving to us and, the, and the, the Torah is giving to us with this b'risa. To elevate, to purify, to be a Kiddush Hashem, to glorify and elevate God's name in the world is an avoda of a very high order. And all beings that desire it have clearly the guidance that's needed for it. And the fact that it's a minute, a minority of the people in the world is not surprising. Right? It's hard work. The work is rewarding. The rewards are very great. The achievement that will bring to civilization is incalculable. I hope and my blessing all of us will be able to take it to the place we're at. The aces and tachmulas, the suggestions and the fixings that the Torah has given us through the Sefer and through other Sefer and through the sacred teachings, right? To elevate ourselves, to be the Tzalem Elohim, to be the lights into the nations of the world. Right? And purifying ourselves, la'at la'at, till we come to the day that we can practice and live the world of Hasidus. Amen.